Well, we're getting to a spot that we have been waiting for for a long time. We are one step closer to deciding this 2024 NASCAR Cup Series Championship. It's the first step of this final weekend as we welcome you to Championship Weekend coverage. And the spotlight is firmly on these four drivers. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Lee Diffie, Steve Letard, and Jeff Burton with you here in the NBC booth, trackside at Phoenix Raceway, where we're going to be talking a whole lot, fellas, about Ryan Blaney, Joey Logano, William Byron, and Tyler Reddick. Here we go. Great group of four drivers, a couple champs, a couple wannabe champs. Blaney, the defending champ. Joey, a two-time champ. And then Byron and Reddick. Byron for the powerhouse of Hendrick Motorsports. Tyler Reddick representing Michael Jordan and Denny Hamlin from 2311. So just so many different storylines. It's, it's a great weekend, to be honest. You know, we get a little extra practice, Jeff, and only we get 15 minutes. We'll get 50 minutes today. Walk in the garage this morning. I had a little old school feel. They're not going to work off from pit road like they do at other weekends. They're going to go in and out of the garage. Three sets of tires. So a lot of opportunity in front of these drivers. Yeah, this is the weekend that you want to be involved in uh, for sure as a race car driver. Winning a championship, is, you've worked your whole life for it. you got your team, everybody at the shop, all the sponsors, just everybody involved is, has worked all year long to get to this point. And now you're getting ready to roll off for the very first time, and you now are going to understand how fast are we. They have all been working on these race cars, knowing how important this race is, and they all have said, this is the best car we've had all year. We've never built a car better than this. And now you're going to go find out if that's real or not. Somebody who lives and breathes the sport of NASCAR Cup Series racing is our Kim Kuhn. And Kimmy, we're getting close up. Cars are rolling. Let's go. We are. And to Steve's point, a lot of time and a lot of tires. 50 minutes, three sets of tires. So these teams will have a lot more notes to pick through overnight than they usually do. That being said, they all agreed. It is about what your car can do on the long run. So look for long runs during this practice. And as we look at the championship four, maybe the most to benefit from this extended practice is William Byron because he's got three teammates to lean on who are outside the playoffs helping them go for this championship. And with that being said, Steve, extra tires extra time teammates how hard is it not to lose direction not to get lost with all the extra options you have this weekend versus when you're just stuck to 15 to 20 minutes of practice well the, the real thing is you know if you're Rudy Fugel and William Byron you stick to your plan and you have teammates in case you need them right Jeff like if you search them out for an answer you want to get an answer back if you're one of William Byron's teammates I'm not going over there to distract or get in the way of what they're doing. I'm kind of waiting to be asked. I'm ready to do my part. Come and tap me on the shoulder if you need a question. But other than that, let this 24 do what they do. So when we come into this championship weekend, Jeff, we come in with one eye looking forward and kind of one eye looking back because last weekend in Martinsville, it has been a hot topic of conversation this week of what went down with several teams. There's William Byron in the 24, but he is shadowed by two fellow Chevrolet drivers that were protecting him. And then you had Bubba Wallace in the 23, open up the gap, Christopher Bell goes through, and then rim shots, that's not allowed. And Christopher Bell did not make it through to this championship four. William Byron had a nervous wait to see what was happening. Meanwhile, the main headline was Ryan Blaney he drove one of the best races of his life to win. Penalties were handed down, and pretty big ones. $100,000 to each of the drivers involved. So that was Ross Chastain and Richard Childress Racing's Austin Dillon and to Bubba Wallace. $100,000 to each of those drivers, plus 50 points. It wasn't just the drivers, it was the teams as well. The teams, each of the three teams were fined $100,000, and they lost 50 team points, owner points. So. For 2311 Racing, they didn't appeal those penalties. Initially, RCR and Trackhouse did. RCR withdrew their appeal, but Trackhouse stuck with it. However, it went to the National Motorsports Appeal Panel, and those penalties were upheld. They remained in place. So those penalties that were levied, they stayed. And yeah, NASCAR made it clear that they're not going to tolerate Teams helping each other to that point. Manufacturers trying to help other manufactured teams and with the penalties, but then also said they're going to review this in the offseason and try to find a way to make the penalties even greater in the future. They stopped it. They said it's not acceptable. 
it happens again, the penalty's going to even be worse. I'm thankful there were penalties. I left the racetrack Sunday night frustrated that we were talking about that. Frustrated we weren't talking about Ryan Blaney, the defending champ, and the drive he put on in the last 50 laps at Martinsville. We had William Byron, we had Chase Sellett, we had Kyle Larson, we had Ryan Blaney. All lead laps. That should have been the conversation that this man in the 12 won his way back into the championship four, won his way to Phoenix to defend. Instead, we're talking about the sort of thing. The integrity of racing should always be above anything else. NASCAR had to step in, and I think those penalties move the story forward. We now know what we see on this track this weekend is going to be great performance behind the wheel of these four championship effort drivers. It was a great race. There was no doubt about it. That put a damper on it. No one wanted to be dealing with that, but now it's the future. Now you got to go win a championship, and what you're seeing right here, Ryan Blaney trying to make the pass on Ross Chastain. This is real world stuff. This is what you're going to have to deal with tomorrow. Blaney's car looks really, really quick. He rolls the center well. Look how much lower he is than Chastain. But you want clean air. You want to be running by yourself to be able to work a plan, Steve. But immediately, Blaney and Logano both in a racing type situation. I thought we were looking at last year's race. Because <laughs> Blaney won the championship, but Chastain won the race, and Blaney lost his mind on the radio trying to get by Chastain in those closing laps. Let's remind you of how it went down here in Phoenix. It was intriguing. It was interesting. If you were a Ryan Blaney fan, you were frustrated because that number one car was just not going anywhere, but staying out in front, Chastain the race, but Blaney the title, his first. First time he made the championship four, by the way, as well. So first time in, capitalized the most, walked away as the NASCAR Cup Series champion. You see right there, Blaney with a big run off of turn two. And he's kind of like, hey, Ross, why don't you just cut me some slack here? I'd like some clean air. Frustration is probably getting a little bit high in that 12 car. He's so much better in one and two. Ross doesn't care. Uh -oh. oh, Jimmy Johnson. In that beautiful scheme on the car that was designed by a fan, a winner of a competition, that fan is here, part of the Legacy Motor Group, but this is not great for JJ. Can't tell from this angle if he has a flat left rear tire. Looks like it just got loose and came around on him. Did a great job not hitting anything. Stands wide open in the gas right there. Now he's done the best he can do and he just locks it down. This is Jimmy's ninth cup weekend of the year. Yet to be determined uh, what next year looks like for the seven time cup series champion. And winner here in Phoenix, of course, as well. So a little hiccup in the early stages of this very valuable practice session on Championship Weekend. A reminder that you can join NASCAR's free rewards program and start earning points that turn into member-only rewards. And you can earn every time you check in for a race, trade points in for free tickets, exclusive gear, autograph merchandise, and one-of-a-kind race day experiences by visiting nascar.com slash fan rewards. We are up and running. 40 minutes left on the board in this all-important Friday practice session, qualifying tomorrow, and, of course, the championship finale here at Phoenix Raceway on Sunday as we check in with Kim Kuhn. Kimmy? Yeah, and as we talk about Ryan Blaney and his opportunity to defend his championship from last year, and specifically where he stands at Phoenix Raceway, it seems like he's coming into the role of what Kevin Harvick was able to do at Phoenix, just being so good here. In the last eight Phoenix races, he's got an average running position of 5.6. That is the best of the championship four drivers. And as you look at the spring and late race, he was the only one to finish top five. So I talked to crew chief Jonathan Hassler, like, what was their plan? Did they like what they had in the spring? And he surprised me. He said they actually came with a different setup approach than what they brought in the spring, even though they finished top five. He said they had to work on that car all day long. They were not good in the first half of the race, but they did make it better. In addition to other things they've learned this season, their plan was to do hopefully three runs this practice because they still had some questions on their list that they wanted answered for Sunday's race. It fascinates me the different personalities of the four teams. I spent some time 
um, with the crew chiefs down in the garage today, kind of walking from garage stall to garage stall, and ask really the same similar questions like, hey, do, per you know, do cars have personalities like they used to? Do you have your favorite? One crew chief, absolutely, this is our favorite. The next crew chief, I don't even know where we ran that car last, right? It, it's, yet they're all here and they're all successful. It just proves that there's so many different approaches to how you could dissect this race or the season or, or the, even the approach for the weekend. Stevie talking about walking through the garage area, folks, and in the garage area, as is the case uh, every year for championship weekend, the championship for Jeff are all garaged next door to each other. And I was spent a little bit of time with Joey Logano's crew chief, Paul Wolf today, and we were standing there looking at each of the four championship cars and I said, there are four very different and compelling stories in these four garages for completely different drivers. Yes, two of them are teammates, but four totally different stories on the year and four stories that are going to keep us glued to these TV screens and this racetrack on Sunday. Every one of them capable of winning this championship. There's no doubt about it. I think this one, to me, is the most interesting. Tyler Reddick, when Denny Hamlin hired Tyler Reddick just before he made it public, I had a conversation with Denny Hamlin. Denny Hamlin told me he was hiring the next superstar in this sport. And I said, well, who is that? And he kind of told me, you know what I mean? He told me who it was. And he was so proud of the fact that he got Tyler Reddick. He did whatever it took to take him and get him from RCR. And he has proven to be that talent. He has proven to have that speed. And think about 2311. They are a young race team. They are not, they have not been around like a Hendrick Motorsports, a Penske. And already they're taking advantage of the assets that they have. Denny Hamlin has done an incredible job of building this race team, hiring the right people, along with Mike, Michael Jordan, and hiring Tyler Reddick. He was so excited about it, and Tyler has delivered and what he believes he can be. Well, we look back at Martinsville. Let's look back even a little further. A couple weeks ago in Miami, this move right here, it could have been Hamlin, it could have been Blaney. Instead, it was Tyler Reddick, which I think is a top three or four move of the year when it comes to one set of corners. It's hard to say it's the best because we've seen so many photo finishes, but in the moment, it was the best for me because I didn't think he could do it to remind the fan the 45 was on a couple lap older tires, had worked, the strategy was a little bit of a Hail Mary staying out, yet he made it work. And Jeff, we talked to him about it this week, and I think I was fascinated. Hey, did you have a plan? Well, kinda. I just knew I was gonna go where he didn't, and then this, and then that. And then he was still a bit shocked. He said he drove it in relative to the 12. He knew he had to be deeper than the 12, and then it stuck, so he just got back in the gas. He made it sound so simple, yet it was so exhilarating to hear his description. When, when we were with our teammate Marty Snyder and we got to sit down with the championship four the other day, Jeff, were you as blown away as I was when I asked Tyler Reddick, was that the move of your career? Was that the best pass yeah, right. you ever pulled off? And he said, no. I was like, what? He, yeah. said, he said the best move was when he passed Cole Custer to win an Xfinity Series championship. I like it. was a little flex. It's like, Diff, you might be new around here, but I've been making moves like this yeah. for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Same track, though. Think about it. Yeah. His favorite move was still at Miami. You know, I've said this, I've said this before many, many times. You have to be uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable putting yourself in positions that others won't. That's what separates the great from the good is wanting that moment and relishing that moment and not being afraid to fail. Because if he jumps it up on it there on the outside and it doesn't work, it's easy to say, well, what are you doing, right? But it did work. And that's just no difference in Michael Jordan saying, give me the ball, I'm gonna take the shot. He might miss it, but he's made more than he's missed. And he has the confidence that he can make it happen. And I, I think that's what, you can see the confidence in, in great race car drivers. They're willing to do things that others aren't. So, let's get the thoughts of the man behind the 45 championship thoughts. Here it is. Probably the biggest thing was just being able to do it for Michael. Um, you know, and him, when Michael and Denny started this thing, it was a dream. And as time went on, it became more and more reality. Then it was born. And now uh, to be in year four, my second year here, to have an opportunity to pull through and, and give Michael and everybody else that's part of 2311 um, what they what they strive to what they what they seek uh, to eventually compete for every single year. So it'd be a, a great opportunity to to start that. 
Tyler Reddick did a couple of races back in 2019, and then he did three full seasons with Richard Childress racing before making that switch. Do you remember when that news broke and uh, he departed? I think he departed. Did he depart a year ahead of schedule from RCR? Did he, yeah. he jumped? He jumped a year ahead, didn't he? And so that's why it was kind of like. It's like the Colts moving out of Baltimore in the yeah. darkness of the night. It was kind of like that sort of move, right? <laughs> Everybody thought he was signed up, and then all of a sudden, he, they actually left and met at a mutual hotel between the two shops to announce the whole thing because they thought it was going to get leaked. It was quite yeah. It was controversial when it, when, it, when it all went down. But just to Jeff's point and Steve's point earlier, this young team has done so much so quickly. And for Tyler Reddick, yes, he knows what it's like to win a championship. That's an Xfinity Series championship. Now he's going for his first Cup Series title. Big weekend for Reddick. Thirty minutes on the clock of valuable practice time here at Phoenix Raceway. There's a guy who would dearly love to be part of the championship for, but he's not. Unfortunately, it didn't go his way last weekend. Kyle Larson, but he said, "Look." I'm going to give it my best. I'm going to go out for one more one more win on the year, which would make seven. And he said, I'm going to be cheering on my teammate as well, William Byron, to try and bring home the title for Hendrick Motorsports. I think Larson right now is near the top of best cars. I think the five looks like the 12. Byron I would put in there. Uh, so no big shock. The two actually is another car that I think has uh, more speed than some of the weeks where he shows up. This is, reminds me a lot of St. Louis. I know Blaney ran out of gas, but Cindric was right there on his heels, went on to win. This is a track that I think suits this two car. I feel like all the Penske's are fast. I know Blaney's down in 23rd. Uh, we've seen that lately, Logano in 12th. We've seen that with Blaney lately, really not show pace and practice, you know, with just one lap. And they haven't been qualifying great, but when the green flag drops, they had tons of speed. I'm actually interested, you mentioned qualifying, to see if with three sets of tires, I'm not sure you're going to use all three in race trim. That's a lot of race trim. Wouldn't shock me to see the last set get bolted on and maybe a qualifying run. you got to be a little careful as the track cools. This practice started pretty close to when checkered flag is going to be on Sunday. So just, you know, you got to be careful. You get an hour past that. Out the track continues to shift down here specifically in three and four completely in the shade which is great for the fans on the right hand side right that's how this place was designed the stands are out of the sun as it starts to set so the message you see there in front of the onboard camera will be something that is repeated a lot this weekend from the fans to martin truex jr who on sunday will start his 684th consecutive race his total at the moment is 692 as far as career races, but 684 consecutively, that is quite the effort. And he goes back, to use the team's phraseology, he goes back to where it all started as far as the scheme on this car for Bass Pro Shops when he made his debut uh, at Atlanta Motor Speedway. That's what it looked like, and it's a, it's a throwback scheme. Johnny Morris, the CEO, the man behind the name, Bass Pro Shops. So this is kind of like... Looking back to go forward in his final full-time cup ride. He started out with DEI, then he went to Chip Ganassi Racing, then he went to Michael Waltrip Racing. Those years at Furniture Row in the 78 before joining Joe Gibbs Racing, and this is his sixth and final year at JGR. It's been quite the career, Jeff. Yeah, it really has. Mark Truex Jr., uh, one of the most liked guys in the garage, he races you hard, gives you everything he has, but at the same time, does it the right way. He, you know, he, all of us makes mistakes, but Mark Truex kind of reminds me of Mark Barton a little bit in the way that he drives a race car, always fast, also tries to be clean. One thing he and every driver are going to have to deal with, this is about when the race is going to end. Look at this sun, and look at the glare on the racetrack. So when you turn down, you don't see the bottom of the racetrack yet. You don't see it till there. So when you're trying to get lined up on where you want your race car, it's a little bit off the of field, Steve. You know you can't see that yellow line shining on it. It's a glare. This racetrack has always been one of the worst racetracks for being able to see the entrance of turn one and where you need to hit your marks. And it will be coming right at the end of the race.
this time of year when everybody has a reason to be mad at somebody, that can be used for an excuse. That sounded like experience, didn't it? <laughs> oh, I couldn't see. The sun was in my eyes. The sun, I didn't. I, I look back to earlier this week when we got to spend some time with William Byron, and it was, I think, impressive at how together he was and I think how driven he is, despite having to go through that really stressful situation last weekend of am, I'm, am I in or am I out? I think when he got the confirmation that he was in, Stevie, it was almost like a boost, it was relief, but it was also a confidence boost. And when we when we sat down with him, he, he had that air of confidence. He did. I had to go back a year ago when William Byron made the championship four for the first time, I asked him the question about so much experience in the organization, whether it's Chad Knaus, who's won seven championships, co-chairman Jeff Gordon, who's done it from the driver's seat, who he leaned on for the experience he was gonna feel out here at Phoenix. And William Byron said, you know, while that's all available, I want to have experienced it all for me. Because not in a boasting way, but he says, I hope my career, I get this opportunity many times to go out here and win a championship. The only way I'm gonna to continue to get better is to experience it all firsthand. Fast forward to just earlier this week, and I felt like that's the driver that was sitting in front of us, is the one that had that confidence of the experience a year ago. And what do you say, Jeff? He goes, a lot's going to be made of practice. A lot's going to be made of qualifying. What I learned last year is this race is very long. Even as short as we want to make it, he goes, I just want to be around for that final pit stop. Pit stop, it might be on the green, it might be on the yellow. I want to have a chance in that final run to the checker. So what would a championship mean to the driver of the famous number 24? It would kind of, it would, it's the top of the mountain. You know, it's the best way to, best way to describe it. And um, you work your whole life and your whole career to get to this point. And for me, not coming from a racing family or not racing when I was five, six years old, like my competitors, I never thought I'd be in this position. So in a lot of ways, um, there's been a lot of doubters and a lot of things along the way that that have had to work out for me to get to this point. So that's that's what you know it would mean to me is the fact that I've gotten to the top of the mountain. This is to me the strengths of William Byron are decision making. He is smooth. It reminds me a little bit of the way he drives a race car, Jimmy Johnson. Right? He doesn't knock you out of the way, move you out of the way. He just tries to go faster than you and nothing seems to rattle him. He's very calm. Yep. And when things start to go bad, and they will, that's part of part of these playoffs. It's not going to go perfect. He keeps it together. He remains calm. And this moment's not too big for William Byron. Playoff drivers, third, ninth, 17th, and 25th. That's just on their outright speed. We'll talk more about consistency when we come back. Here's what the weekend looks like. Tomorrow, Saturday, 7 p.m. Eastern on the CW NASCAR Countdown Live, and then the Xfinity Series Championship decider who is going to get it. That's at 7.30 Eastern. Then on Sunday, we'll see you at 2 p.m. Eastern on Peacock and on NBC. Countdown to green, and then the Cup Series title will be decided 3 p.m. Eastern. Cannot wait. It's both on network television, on NBC, and on Peacock. It is a huge weekend ahead welcome you back we've got just over 20 minutes left 20 minutes of valuable track time this is great to get this much running on the weekend when it counts the most yeah, it's fun to watch these drivers you can kind of get a sense of who's fast on a long run who's fast on a short run i talked about blaney not really being fast taking off in practice well guess what <laughs> just went to p1 on the board logano he ran his fastest lap of the day a few laps ago as well And here is Joey in that Shell Pennzoil 22, two-time champ, trying to become a three-time champ. We've mentioned this over the last couple of weekends. He's already accomplished so much, but if you kick it up another notch as far as titles to three, he's living in a very special space in the history of this sport. Let's talk more about Logano. Here's Kim. You know, he's been in this position before where he's won the opening race in the round of eight and then gone on to win the championship. So I spent some time with crew chief Paul Wolf this morning and just said, 
really, when do the other three championship teams catch up? Because you've been in this position before, you've seen it. He looked at me dead in the face and he said, they don't. And I thought that spoke volumes of the confidence of this team, of what they think they have this weekend. Right now, though, Joey, the exit of turn two is where they're getting beat the most. They told him three and four looks pretty good, though. Yeah, the exit of turn two right here. This is, I think, the most difficult part of the racetrack. You've got to you to roll through the center of running one and two with nice speed, go to the throttle. Look at the difference in the racetrack. And let's ride along and listen to when he's able to get in the throttle, one of the racetrack versus the other, going into turn one, out of the gas, listen to when he goes back to the throttle. A long time before he's able to touch the gas not able to go to the gas aggressively. Lifts earlier into three, but watch this. Boom, already back to the throttle. Completely different corners. And it's very difficult to have your car drive in both corners the way you want it to. So you as a driver, you as a team have to make a decision. You don't know if your car is gonna be better in one end of the corner, one end of the racetrack or the other till you get here. You may have some ideas, but once you get here, and the evidence is what it is. You have to decide, what am I willing to give up on one end of the racetrack to potentially gain on the other? So we've been giving you these sound bites, these really interesting and insightful sound bites from the championship four on what a championship would mean. You heard that from the two guys who haven't won a cup championship yet in William Byron and Tyler Reddick. What would three be like for Joey? When you have a great boss, you want to be able to excel and show them what you got and provide a reason why they hired you, right? Like, and racing for championships is that reason why he hired me and why he hired our whole race team. Everybody that's in the door is there for a reason. Uh, and the reason's to win. Like, that is the only reason Team Penske is around as a race team. It is there to win. Like, that's, that's why we're there. We're not there to make money. We're there to win. Um, and being part of that is, is something that um, is really special, but you also want to live up to that, right? Because that's a lot of pressure as well. And Stevie, when Joey says you want to live up to that, there is actually a little extra element of pressure than normal within Team Penske, because this has been an extraordinary year for the captain and his various divisions within his racing organization, because the year started with their sports car, their IMSA WeatherTech sports car team winning the Rolex 24 at Daytona overall. Joseph Newgarden went on to win his second Indianapolis 500. The team, the sports car team, then went on to win the, the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. And then they recently wrapped up the hypercar division in the World Endurance Championship, or WEC. So win, 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 win. The only thing they didn't win was the IndyCar Championship. But everything else, every other major thing that they're participating in, they've won this year. Well, I think, you know, we talk a lot about the business of NASCAR, and that's when we talk owners, but sometimes we forget that while the business is real, Jeff, these owners are here because they, they're they successful in whatever they do, whether it's Michael Jordan on the basketball court or in business or Roger Penske in business or Rick Hendrick. You know, these, as Joey Logano said, you know, these teams are built upon trophies and trophy cases and championships. And... And they do it in this interesting way, right? They don't bang their fist on the table saying we have to win. They lead by example, and you get this internal competition. As you just pointed out, sports car to Indy car to cup car is now two cup drivers in the same opportunity, right? Internal competition is like the healthiest uh, kind of form of pressure. And, and Team Penske has two in a row looking for three and has two of the four contestants that have a chance. There's a lot going right for Penske. And their cars are right beside each other too, by the way. Ryan is in the far end of the garage, their, their particular area of the garage, and Joey is right next door. And then you have the, uh, the Hendrick and the 2311 car. Less than 15 minutes to go in this practice session. Whoa. That was pretty close. For Briscoe, came up on Fincham there, Jeff, pretty quickly. Yeah, it was quickly. <laughs> I 
at 14 right there of Briscoe in front of Blaney. You know, what's going to be... Make sure we have to tell this story on Sunday because there's so many men and women. Tony Stewart, Gene Haas, the Stewart Haas race has been around for so long, and it was announced months ago now, Jeff. So for us, I guess we kind of knew this day would come, but now the day is here, or the weekend is here, right? The last time that Stuart Haas will compete as Stuart Haas. I know there'll be a fact, you know, Haas factory team, they'll have a cup car and some Xfinity cars, but what we know is Stuart Haas is coming to an end. Championships, race wins, Chase Briscoe put this magical run on in the playoffs by winning with that big move at Darlington, kind of out of nowhere. I have to say, I didn't have 14 on my radar that weekend, but he proved us all wrong. That's really added a little bit, you know, just a little something special to this last year, which I know is bittersweet. With so many involved. I was, I was in, um, I was in the 14 hauler several races ago, and I asked some of the guys. I said, "Is is pretty much everybody going to be okay? Like everyone scatters right to to different teams. Some will stay for the Haas factory team and Cole Custer, but I think, and this is a generalisation, uh, that I think the majority will be okay. They'll land somewhere." And you hope so. I mean, it's, it's we talk a lot about race wins, and we're going to talk a lot about a championship because that's life-changing for these four drivers that can hoist the championship trophy. Well, in a negative, right, when a team like Stuart Haas closes down, that's life-changing for all the men and women that called that home. That was their place of employment. That's where they blood, sweat, and tears were poured out. So I hope, to your point, that generalization is true, and all the people that found it, an opportunity in the sport that want to continue in the sport find a home somewhere else. Still plenty of time left on track, and the Championship Four are going to maximize that. Shadows really blanketing a good portion of Phoenix Raceway here on Championship Weekend. As we welcome you back, we're winding down final ten and a half minutes of this practice session. Uh, qualifying tomorrow, and then of course race day on Sunday on Network, on NBC and on Peacock going to be a terrific weekend the Xfinity series will get decided tomorrow and then cup on Sunday well my handicapping at the moment if I look at just the championship for the standout on overall pace I believe is the 12 of Blaney it's not a huge standout I think he has a little bit of an advantage over every or his three other championship four competitors Denny Hamlin for non-playoff cars I think it's Denny Hamlin and Kyle Larson uh, Trex, maybe at time, I think those three kind of are grouped together as the best three of the non-playoff drivers. Well, look at your point on, on Ryan Blaney. Not only overall speed, but best on five lap, 10 lap, and 15 lap runs. That looks pretty good when you're coming off a victory to get yourself into the championship four, doesn't it? That's what you're looking for. Absolutely. Well, I, I think that's, that's the strength of Blaney, right? I mean, he's just fast. And I just believe you're going to have to go through him to win this championship. He did he Hamlin disappointed. He did a great job last week. Did he Hamlin had a nice round of eight in the playoffs. He really did. He did a good job. His team did a good job. Just tough break in Martinsville. You know, had to go, had to prepare that car, lost all of that practice, had to start last, drove through the field, put themselves in position, but just a little bit off of pace. And you have to wonder, losing that practice, uh, having to make repairs to the backup car, if that was really their best opportunity. Uh, had a bad, had some bad luck, but made, the, made a lot of it, I think. But I'm sure they wish they could start that Martinsville weekend over. Talk a lot about overall pace. I'd be interested if somebody does a qualifying run here at the end of practice. Qualifying will set not only the starting order, but also pit picks for the championship four. So as we take a closer look, pit stall one right here is where it always is. But one thing that's changed is the yellow line is where it always has been. But the camera now has moved to the yellow line. The camera used to be about right here. So it's moved this direction, 75 feet. The yellow line is now. So pit stall one is an advantage but it is a smaller advantage than it used to be because you used to be able to just drop the jack and barely accelerate forward. Now this is the camera which is on the speed line which is now 70 feet farther forward out of pit stall one. So Jeff, a pole is still the goal, but with this big long sweeping pit road and all the openings, I think there's a bunch of good pit stalls and I think this change to pit stall one I think is right for a championship race. We should make them all a little bit more equitable. So this takes away a little bit of the advantage of one. 
I think it should be like that everywhere. Yeah, By the I, way, for 30 years, I've been saying that. I just, well, because I qualified badly. I, I, never, had, I never had pit stall one. So I always thought that pit lane, that, that not pit out, but the timing line should be moved further down, down the racetrack. Our telestrator Picasso is Steve Letard. He won't let Jeff or myself anywhere near it. But we did get treated today to Jeff taking us around in the pace car. Stevie, draw where we went today in regards to pit out and how wide the track is there, down off the apron, down across there. It was a crazy ride. Thanks again oh. for that, Jeff. It well, was yeah. amazing. Listen, these cars will be going all the way down, almost hitting this pit lane and blending back up. It's going to be crazy once they come by the start finish line. You're going to turn dead left on the restarts. And, and down here, they're going to be like five wide trying to figure it out into turn one. This right here. Jeff, go ahead and spot. Just let me know which car you want to clear. <laughs> not clear, not clear. Yeah, I, I, that is, it is wild. And then seeing them sort it out when they get into turn th turn one, where do you go? How do you know if you're clear or not? How do you know that someone is going to go to the second or the third lane? Not clear, too, too low, three high. <laughs> what, I, what I love is these guys make it look pretty simple, but diff, how rough is that transition? That was mind blowing. And that was, that was in the pace car. Um, can't imagine what it's like in these race cars that are a lot stiffer than the Toyota Camry that we were cruising around in, Kimmy. It was quite the ride. I'm mad I didn't get an invite, but as you guys are talking pit stall selection, that moving of the timing line in off that box one, that's caught the attention of some crew chiefs. The other thing that has caught attention of crew chiefs when it comes to pit box selection is this is a full field. There are 40 cars. The last five races here, there have only been 36 cars in the field, and we haven't seen 40 cars here since the fall of 2017. So what does that mean? It means there will be some pick boxes that aren't as advantageous as they have been in the past, where there are no longer open stalls around them that have created that benefit. So I want to argue with Steve and say there's actually not as many good pit stalls as there have been in the past handful of years here. Yeah, and, and I would agree with Kim to say you know, this is unfortunate to say, but 10 years ago, you could kind of predict who wasn't going to have the best day, and you could kind of pit around them, hoping they'd be a lap down. But with the how close the entire field is now, Jeff, I don't think there's a driver or a team that you can rule out to have a decent day and be on the lead lap. I got to be in your way, is what I mean, if you're pitting around them. Going to duck away just for a second, come back and finish off this practice session. See you in a moment. Three minutes to go. Let's make the most of it. Let's crank out a few more laps in this practice on a Friday on Championship Weekend in the NASCAR Cup Series. Look who's on top. One of the Championship Four and the reigning champion who's going to try and defend his title on Sunday. William Byron is fourth on the speed chart. Joey Logano ninth and Tyler Reddick in 21st. Look at that glare. Chase Elliott, you saw that big reflection and that flash in his visor. What's that like? We all know what it's like, Jeff, to drive down the highway and get a bit of sun and you reach up and you put the shield down, the block. But what's it like in a race car when you're going at this speed and you've got to be so focused? Well, the problem is that what you're trying to do is, you know, if you drive the car into the corner 10 feet too far or 10 feet not far enough, you've messed the lap up. So now, you do that visually, you find something to look at. I looked at the left side of the car. I looked at the yellow line. I looked at what I was trying to hit with my left front tire. And when the glare is on it, I couldn't see it. And then I also couldn't see my braking zone. So it messed up my rhythm. We used to qualify here and it was really bad. And that was a major challenge. Interesting enough, we talked about the differences of the racetrack. Look down here, fourth gear. It's the rev chip. Runs fourth gear all the way down the back straightaway. Now we're down in three and four. You're going to see an acceleration and a shift up to fifth. So the speed difference on the two straightaways is great enough that high gear needed on the front stretch, only fourth gear needed on the back stretch. Told you about the Menards Ford, the 12 of Ryan Blaney, quickest in this session and quickest, as we said earlier, across five, 10, and 15 lap runs. It's looking really good. You know, we, we spoke about the inner workings at Team Penske and what the other racing divisions have done and how successful they've been this year. Scott McLaughlin, three-time Aussie Supercars champion and front runner in 
the NTT IndyCar Series. He told me yesterday he sent Ryan Blaney a text after that devastating loss at Homestead, and he said, listen, my brother, Martinsville is your house. Go get it. And he did. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Good yeah. morale. Yeah, they're good buddies. They enjoy spending time with each other. See Blaney trying to make a rude right here. Steve, I feel good about where he is. Practice matters here. Blaney was the best in practice last year. He won the championship. Bell was the best in practice in March. He won that race. Good start for this team. Yeah, if I had a handicap all for the championship four, I would say Blaney is the leader. Tied for second would be the 22 and the 24. I think the 22 found some speed here at the end as the red flag finally flies for the end of practice. Reddick, not far off. You know, being honest, he's the distant of the four. He's the he's the slowest of the four, but that's practice. They'll make changes. Check this out. On board, William Byron, and we hear this was a pretty close call. How close? Oh. That's close enough. That was almost Kyle Larson-esque, where he ducked out behind and collected the... Uh, the bundles at Homestead. You're buying, working on trying to get on pit road to maximize pit road speed if you had to pit under caution. I'm sorry, under green. Again, we talked about that sun, that yeah. glare. So for, for Ryan Blaney, Stevie, he turned 46 laps for William Byron, 50 laps for Logano, 61 laps. And for Tyler Reddick, he clocked 52 laps. Yeah, and as I was mentioning, you kind of look at the grouping, right? The, the front three, you can move around, stand out for Blaney. Reddick just a little bit off, but, you know, that's why you have to run the race, right? Starts with qualifying, pit stop strategy. So much opportunity in this race to kind of not only get your car better, but get that track position you need. Yeah, and with the extended practice and also being on Friday, it gives the teams a lot of time to work. Right. A lot of time to look at the data, look at the information, talk to the driver really analyze and then how do you use the teammates right how do you take advantage of all the data that you have to be able to really make the right choices kim yeah and that's what i was going to lean into is they've got all this extra time to kind of make some decisions so what kind of decisions are you making and how are you making sure you're not going down the wrong path before sunday difficult i mean it, look Practice is good, but it's outside what we currently do, Jeff. That's the challenge, right? The challenge is that normally you get 15 minutes of practice. Now you've had an hour. Now these guys are the best of the best. So I think they know how to adjust it both from the driver's seat and the pit box. But you can use it to help you. You could easily use it to distract you and kind of get off your game. Whole lot going on. Look at this for a very busy Saturday. We've got Xfinity Series qualifying. Cup Series qualifying, that's tomorrow, will be on USA. And then on the CW is the NASCAR Countdown Live leading to the Xfinity Series Championship on the CW. Who's going to get that done? That's going to be fascinating considering what went down in the practice session and the big crash. And then on Sunday, we're on network television and on Peacock Countdown to Green at 2 Eastern. And then we go racing from 3 and there will be a post-race show as well to celebrate who it is, whoever wins this title.